It is the 2nd of August, 1826, 7am. Two men stand side on to one another, boots wet with morning dew, holding pistols by their sides. A navy lieutenant stands counting aloud. One. Two. A young man next to him cuts in. Lower your weapon, sir. You may aim on the mark of your second. The Navy Lieutenant begins anew. One. Two. Three. Gentlemen, are you ready? One man's arm is steady as a rock. The other is shaking from the weight of the pistol. Shaking from the anticipation of his own mortality. Fire! When a piece of lead shot, a bullet, pierces the flesh, it must first pass through your clothes. You'd think they rip and tear, but they don't. The force of the bullet punches a hole through the fabric and takes it with it. As it punctures the skin, the force of the shockwave rippling through the air fragments the bone on either side of the bullet. It and its new parade of shattered bone pierce the organ, while the shockwave ruptures and traumatises. The tiny scrap of unwashed fabric clinging to the bullet begins the process of infecting the wound before it's even finished being made. And then, before the victim feels the pain, the bullet leaves the body and lands innocuously on the ground, leaving behind it a tiny hole where it entered, and a larger, vicious or gory hole where it left. It's about that moment that it all explodes, the searing pain, the shock. Of course, it depends on what kind of bullet, what kind of injury, but if the bullet passes through the lung and the heart and exits through the back, it doesn't take long to realise. Time's up. This is Scotland, a podcast about history and where we made it. I'm Michael Park. You never cared for David Landale. Not to say that Landale is a bad man. You don't have any evidence to the contrary, but there's just something about the way he carries himself. Like he's better than you. Like if he stepped on you in the street, he'd feel the need to use a branch to get you off his shoe. Even in church on a Sunday, you can see him looking down his nose at you, like he's nobility or something. But he's no better than you, or your brother. You're the town's money men. What could be more respectable than being a banker? You'd served. You'd been a lieutenant in the Fifeshire Militia. What had Landale ever done? apart from swan around being well regarded by the people of Kirkcaldy. They didn't even know that Landale was almost flat broke. His linen business was losing money hand over fist thanks to the defeat of Napoleon. There weren't as many soldiers needing uniforms, so there weren't as many pounds for David Landale. In fact, he'd come to you just that week looking for a thousand pound overdraft. Your brother had said he could have it. He'd shaken on it, idiot. But you don't think Landale can afford to make good on the payments. So you write to him, and you tell him, in the politest possible terms, where he may stick his thousand pounds. To say you're then seething as you read a letter from the Bank of Scotland demanding to know why you've apparently reneged on an agreement, well, that would be an understatement. That sneaky snake Landale has gone full Karen and spoken to your managers. You reply that you don't believe Landale is good for the money, and you're merely protecting the interests of the bank and all of its customers from being stained by bad credit. That'll show him. People always suck up to him just because he lost his father and then his wife inside six months. But sorry, pal, if you can't make your business ends meet, then it's not going to be up to Lieutenant George Morgan to bail you out. You tell another local businessman that exact thing, 
In fact, you'll tell anyone who'll listen that Landale is in financial trouble. What's that saying? Gossip's like glitter. You can never really clear it up. And once you write to Landale and tell him that you expect an apology for him going over your head to moan to the bank, things start to snowball. Maybe you shouldn't have signed your letter as Lieutenant George Morgan. It was kind of an aggressive move to remind him that you used to be in the army and you have a certain way of solving problems. And yet, you were the one who had been wronged. Imagine the temerity of that Landale speaking to your bosses over a handshake. His reply lands on your doormat the next morning as you're cleaning your pistols over breakfast. Surprise, surprise. He won't do the decent thing and apologise publicly for doubting you. You make a note in your diary to pop down to the blacksmith and order three dozen pistol balls. You're going to have to start practising. After all, can't allow this insult to pass without reaction, but you won't be challenging that upstart. As you leave the house, clutching your umbrella, despite it being a beautiful summer morning, you know of one way to make damn sure he challenges you. You see, gentlemen have a code. Some might call it fragile masculinity, petty-mindedness, or downright pig-headed stupidity. But it's a system of honour that you, and even the likes of Landale, live stringently by. If you're insulted, you have the right, nay, the responsibility, to challenge that insult and demand satisfaction. But Landale's some wet merchant, and you're a crackshot soldier, so if you challenge him, well that's basically murder. Landale leaves the bookshop and crosses the street in front of you. If he challenges you, you're hitting him on the back with your umbrella before he even knows it. Not too hard, just hard enough that he feels it and making enough noise that everyone in the street sees it. Checkmate, mate. It's not long before a letter from Landale arrives, challenging you to a duel at Carrington just outside the town. It's almost the perfect way to get rid of him for good. Do away with the smug denizen of the town and show your prowess in the dueling grounds in the process. Oh yes, this is going to be the thing that puts George Morgan on the map. Needless to say, you accept the challenge and immediately start practising. You hear that Landale pops off to Edinburgh to buy himself a set of dueling pistols, despite never having fired a gun in his life cute. Every duelist needs a good second, and you ask a navy lieutenant you're vaguely acquainted with since no one else will agree. Milne will do. The others complaining about an ungentlemanly assault are just idiots. You send Milne to meet William Milley, the second of Landale, and he offers him your terms. You'll both admit you were equally culpable and the whole thing can be called off. You know fine well he won't go for it. And it'll be the death of him. And so, it is the 2nd of August, 1826. 7am. You and David Landale stand side on to one another, boots wet with morning dew, holding pistols by your sides. Your second stands, counting aloud. One. Two. Lower your weapon, sir. You may aim on the mark of your second. One. Two. Three. Gentlemen, are you ready? You hold your pistol out ahead of you, strong as a rock. Landale's hand is shaking from the weight of the pistol. Shaking from the anticipation of his own mortality. Fire! You'd think that clothes would rip and tear, but they don't. The force of the bullet punches a hole through the fabric and takes it with it. Not that infection is going to be a problem for you. 
You blink in disbelief as you see Landale's face reappear from the cloud of smoke. He's staring back at you, more perplexed than jubilant. You don't see any holes in his clothes, although your vision has been clearer. You cough, wetter than most of your coughs. Probably the blood. The blood. You drop to your knees before you feel the pain. The bullet has long since left your body, leaving behind it a tiny hole where it entered, and that vicious, ragged hole significantly larger in your back. You're dead inside a minute, a traumatic wound to your heart and lungs. Landale, the reluctant duelist, is the victor and immediately goes into hiding. A warrant is issued for his arrest and a trial date set in Perth. The merchant who fled from the dueling grounds and the corpse of his bank manager to the Lake District, tells the court he will return to face them. And he does. A month after your death, weeks after you've been laid to rest in the family plot, after your name has been ignominiously left off the headstone, Landale faces trial for your murder. You never understood why everyone respected Landale so much why people liked him so much. He wasn't even nobility, just a merchant that never had a nasty word to say about anyone. Even the judge agreed, and so did the jury. It only took them a few seconds of hushed whispering to return a not guilty verdict. They didn't even leave the courtroom. Landale goes on to become Lord Provost of Kirkcaldy. He marries... He has 11 children. One of his daughters grows up and marries someone, Alexander Morgan, your nephew. They start a business, the Landale and Morgan Trading Company. In a way, you're finally in business together. The pious merchant, the bullying ex-soldier banker, the final insult to your imagined honour. You've been listening to Scotland. It was written and produced by me, Michael Park, and is a production of Be Quiet Media. The music for every episode of Scotland is by our very own dashing duelist, Mitch Bain. You can check out more of his work at mitchbain.bequiet.media. Additional voices in this episode were by Chris Moriarty and Mitch Bain. Jamie Mowat does amazing illustrations for us, which you can see in our episode art. Check out more and buy prints at tidlin.com. Scotland is supported by Chris Lingwood, Scott McCubbin, and listeners like you on Patreon. You can get loads more from us for as little as $2 per month at patreon.com forward slash Scotland History Podcast. You can find out more about the show and read transcripts on our website, scotlandpodcast.net. And we're on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram by searching Scotland, a Scottish History Podcast. Thanks for listening. Look after one another. Wear a mask. Don't get into any jewels. See you next time.